thank you everybody for coming on my birthday to celebrate it. <laughs> I am a uh, scientist, um, as we can see on his badge here. Actually, I'm a neuroscientist, so go brains. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, today I'm going to tell you a story about uh, how actually studying birds helps us understand our own ability to do what I'm doing now, which is spoken language or speech. Uh, <clears throat> And that's amazing because uh, some of these birds can do what we can do better than, let's say, a dog or even a monkey that's closer related to us. So I'm going to tell you some things about uh, this and the interesting biology. And maybe some of you, after this, would want to be a neuroscientist. So uh, what we study for human speech is something called vocal learning, or the ability to imitate sound. I say brains, you say go. Go brains. Go brains, I'm sorry, yes. All right, so you just imitated me. All right, so that's a rare behavior. And what I'm going to tell you about is something about that behavior, the anatomy, that is the connections in the brain that control it, as well as the genes that control those connections. So uh, for the behavior, only a few species out there can do this. Us humans, that gives us language. Uh, these are called cetaceans. Anybody know what cetaceans are? Why should I pick on that one? Yes, you, you knew too. <laughs> okay. Yes, give me your resume too. So whales and dolphins, bats, elephants, sea lions. These are all species that can actually imitate sounds, not as much as humans, but they can, and parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds amongst birds. They're close relatives like chimpanzees for us or a, a falcon for parrots can't actually imitate sound. So they all evolved this ability that has came about it independently from a common ancestor, meaning that you know, it's like two people figure out the same thing twice without talking to each other. So, <clears throat> but this behavior is, is very uh, different from other kinds of behaviors that language depends upon that is common throughout all animals. For example, something called auditory learning. The ability to learn sounds that you hear, the meaning of it, that's very common, even though we use it for language. But just because you have it doesn't mean you can do this. For example, you can teach your dog using the word sit, siente say in Spanish, uh, osawati in Japanese, and so on, roll over, get the ball, and so forth. The dog can understand all those human words through auditory learning, but the dog can't say, OK, you got it, I'll sit. <laughs> all right? That is, the dog doesn't have vocal learning. OK, you got that distinction now? OK. Now, like I said, not all these vocal learners are as good as humans, but we got some birds out there that are re quite remarkable, right? And as long as they're raised with humans and you teach them, you can get something like this. What seems to be the problem, officer? I am not a My name is Disco. I'm a parakeet. <laughs> <laughs> so Disco, a parakeet, which is basically a small parrot. Yeah, you like that. I'll play it again. <laughs> seems to be the problem, officer. I am not a cook. My name is Disco. I'm a parakeet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so obviously he knows he's not a crook. He knows he's a parakeet. And Disco learned up to 400 words in four years. And he could recombine words into new sentences. Many times they don't have meaning to the listening people, but other times they do, like you hear here. That's quite remarkable. I bet you you can't get your dog to do that. So. <clears throat> But every once in a while, there's some scientists that get really excited. And uh, one of our closest relatives, they think, oh, is starting to learn how to imitate human speech. This is the best our closest relative could do. So listen. How about when you're um, coughing? <coughs> that was good. You did a sneeze and then a cough. Excellent. That's excellent. But Coco didn't say, my name is Coco. I'm a gorilla, not a crook. All right, so what's going on here? Coco, raised with humans for 39 years, right, can understand human speech, as you can tell, understands the question, and can control air going up through the vocal tract, but it can't control the muscles here to modulate all the sounds like I'm doing now. It somehow ha doesn't have that ability. The brain is not connected to the muscles in the same way as us humans and these birds. So <clears throat> yes, that's been causing us scientists, like us here, right, to try to get our closest relatives to say something simple as apple, when you got these darn parrots that are much more distantly related to us, 
uh, who can actually even go one further and say golden delicious dummy, all right? And so uh, what is it about our brains and the brains of these birds that can do this that this monkey can't? And that's the question we've been asking. Uh, and I've come up with my lab, uh, as all the students and staff studying my lab come up with a new idea we call the motor theory of vocal learning origin. I'll explain what that is. So here is another vocal learning bird. This is a canary, all right? It sings something like this. Can any of you imitate that song? Try, somebody try. Very good, very good, you're getting there. You see how hard it is to imitate canary song? That's right, okay, you're, you're getting there, that's right. So it's not easy, but that's an imitated song like we imitate speech. And with that, when the bird sings those imitated songs, what happens in its brain, you see these white labeled regions here? They're activated genes. You heard about genes a minute ago. Well, certain genes are changing or becoming more active in the brain regions that control the ability to sing in these white signals here. This is the front of the brain, this is the back. And we use this molecular mapping tool as a way to identify brain regions that are active during communication, hearing and speaking and so forth. And what we found when we did that in all birds, what you see here, blue regions are regions that are responsible for hearing sounds and auditory or hearing learning. And all species have that. Red and yellow regions are regions responsible for imitating and producing the imitated sounds. And only the vocal learning species, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds have that. And what's remarkable, uh, looking at this tree here, which is a family tree of birds, like, you know, you have a family, right? You have cousins, right? Well, all these bird species are cousins to each other, all right? And this is their common ancestor. But only some cousins can imitate sounds and others can't. And looking at this genetic tree of all these species, you can see the vocal learners in red dots here are distantly related to each other. That is, you have lots of species here like penguins and ducks and pigeons and so forth that cannot imitate. So how did you come up with the same solution three times in the last 65 million years, right? That's quite remarkable for imitating sound. That's what we're asking. And we're asking, could have human brains come up with the same way of imitating sound? Is our brain similar? Well, the first lesson you learn by looking at this is here is a songbird. That's a canary or a zebra finch sized brain. Here is a songbird brain to a human. You can fit 3,000 songbird brains into one human brain. So brain size doesn't matter, okay? So if somebody says you got a bird brain, ignore them, okay? Because you can pre be pretty smart, all right? <clears throat> the other thing is cortical folding. The noodle-like structures on the brain don't matter either. That is, the bigger the body, the more folding you have, okay? But it doesn't always, it's not always a measure of intelligence. What's a measure, I think, is the presence or absence of a kind of network. Anybody heard the term networks? Right, like your computer network and so forth? It's the network in the brain. And doing a lot of analysis, what we find is humans have similar networks for imitating vocalizations as these birds do, all right? A famous region called Broca's area involved in speech imitation, the space motor cortex involved in producing sounds only in humans, but not in dogs, not in monkeys. But all species have this region here that for auditory learning, including dogs. And this is why I think they understand the sounds sit, siente se, come here boy, fetch the newspaper and so on. So <clears throat> how could this come about in separate ways or separately in humans and birds and so forth? We think the answer comes from this study here. Remember I said these are the brain regions activated when the bird sings? Guess what? We find that those vocal learning brain regions are inside of other brain regions that become active when the birds hop like this, or, or learn how to run, or learn how to walk, or learn how to fly, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and that's the case for all of the vocal learning species. But the pigeons, the chickens, they don't have the vocal learning nuclei. They just have the motor regions that control other body parts. So what could have happened here? Um, <clears throat> what's interesting is that these brain regions also become active, we think, when only vocal learners 
the only ones can also learn how to dance. And that's shown here. Hi, Snowball. So I read it. This is, this is so much better than Dancing with the Stars. Tell us very briefly what Snowball can do, and then we'll witness it for ourselves. Well, Snowball can dance to a beat, and he actually adjusts his dancing to fit the tempo of music. In the tempo, he's going he's gonna to put his biggest Shall body efforts on the one, two, three, four. One, two, three. <laughs> does, does he like for everybody to join in? <laughs> Shall we? <laughs> oh, by the way, here are scientists up here. Are they better than the bird, or the bird's better than them? <laughs> All right, <laughs> you can go on YouTube and look at these videos. What's interesting is that when we humans dance and you put our, us in an imaging machine and look out at our brain activity, like this person here who's doing some choreographed dance movements, you find the brain areas that are most active are adjacent to regions that we know are involved in speech production. So th somehow there's this relationship, we think, with the ability to evolve language and the ability to dance, all right? <clears throat> And so putting all that together, I, I and my lab members have come up with an idea. We say that all species that can vocalize, even the chicken doing the cock and cobble do or the dog barking, right? They have these what we call lower brain stem areas that produce those innate sounds. All species have these four brain areas in your, you know, the front of the brain here that control learning how to walk, learning how to fly, learning how to do sign language and so forth. And what I think happened is that somehow in humans and these vocal learning birds, this pathway duplicated and got hooked up to the brain area that controls sound and takes control of it, except now, instead of learning how to walk, we learn how to vocalize, okay? So <clears throat> we call this the motor theory of vocal learning origin, but by doing that, even after the duplication and connecting it up to the voice neurons, here in the brain, the voice cells, we think something happened to the surrounding brain areas that allow only these species to learn how to synchronize the sounds that they hear to their body movements, meaning learning how to dance. So how we're gonna test that, and with genes, and so that's the last part of my talk here, where <clears throat> what we've done is we dissected out the brain regions that are controlled vocal learning in all these different species, and looked at their genes, the, the dark, the, uh, brighter the purple, the more expressed the particular gene is in that brain region. Some people did this for humans as well and monkeys. And we also looked at the genes that are in all these different human brain areas here, in the cortex, the cerebellum is called, and, and so on. And <clears throat> then we use computer programs, like you program for games. Well, we do that for science, all right? And we're not really playing a game here. We're asking the question. Is there anything in the songbird brain that is similar to the human speech areas that you don't find in species that can't imitate? And the answer is yes, by looking at these genes. This region that controls the ability to produce the song is similar to the region that controls our ability to produce speech. This region that sequences the song is similar to our region of the brain that also produces the sequences of sounds for speech, and so on. So we find these areas of the songbird brain are similar to speech areas of human brains and we cannot find those areas in chickens or monkeys. That's remarkable. And guess what? We also found areas surrounding these brain regions in the vocal learning birds that are also different than what we find in the chicken or monkeys that we think could be responsible for learning how to dance. All right? And here, I, those are pictures. Now, for the... The children here, you may not understand all of this, but I just want you to understand a little bit of it. So I'm showing you what we call primary data. This, the white signal here is the gene product again, and here is the specialized gene regulation. It's turned off in this vocal learning brain region, and the white signal here means turned off in humans as well. We think this gene controls special connections for learning how to speak. And we think if we can turn off I mean, turn up that gene in the not vocal learning species will prevent it from imitating. We think if we can take a chicken and turn it off, we might actually produce a connection from a pathway that controls learning how to walk, hook it up to the vocal areas, 
and get this chicken to learn how to sing. Wouldn't that be remarkable? All right. We like to do that to a mouse, too. OK? Uh, but it turns out that actually mice have these high pitch ultrasonic vocalizations that when you bring them down to our hearing range, sound like this. OK? Like a bird. That's right. We, did, we were surprised. As scientists were surprised when they heard this. Uh, this is called a sonogram. It's sound here and time along this axis here. And the guys like to sing these songs to the females and say, hey, am I sexy? Am I sexy? And so forth, OK? <laughs> All right? And um, <clears throat> yeah, OK. Yeah. And so <laughs> what we find in these mice is they also have neurons or cells in their brains, in their cortex, that makes a very weak connection to the brain, to the neurons that control vocalization. Not a strong one. And they don't have down regulation of this gene here. So it's not like they have nothing. Is they have a little bit of a pathway. And this is mostly innate sounds, even though it sounds like a bird. Uh, <clears throat> and so that gene that I just showed you is a gene that's regulated by another one that we know in humans, when mutated, causes a speech problem. And here's an example called FOXP2G. Your name? <laughs> She's trying to say Laura. Where do you live, Laura? She's trying to say Sheffield. And how old are you? Four. She said four. OK. So Laura, unfortunately, has a, a, a change in this gene. It doesn't affect her ability to imitate, I mean, to hear sounds and have auditory learning because she can understand. But she has difficulty producing. Anybody here, like four, five, or six years old? There you are. Say Laura. Say your name. OK, see how, how well a four-year-old child can say that? So, <clears throat> so we've been, been uh, modulating this gene in the songbird brain areas for imitation, turned it off here, uh, and asked, can birds imitate sounds? Got two more slides to go, and I'll be done. All right. And we find if what happens here is an uh, adult zebra finch singing. OK, that's what it sounds like. Here's his normal tutor. I'll play that again. Here's another one. And here's one where we turned off the Fox P2 gene. I don't. Now, if you can hear the difference, he could not imitate as well, just like Laura couldn't. So this gene in birds is being used in a similar way in humans as for speech, even though our common ancestor was 300 million years ago. And if we put the human mutation into mice, we find that the mice can't switch to these more complex songs here uh, that the females like. They only produce these more simple ones, just like humans can't produce complex sequences. Um, even though mice are just rudimentary, uh, have rudimentary abilities for vocal learning. And finally, we show here that if you give a, a, a lady a choice between hearing the more complex song and the more simple one, she'll go by the speaker that guy is singing the more complex one. Okay? So we think what's happening here is vocal learning is not all or none. We humans, parrots, and songbirds are advanced. Okay? Mice have a little bit of ability. Dogs, go on YouTube. You'll see some dogs trying to say, oh, 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 right? A little bit of ability, OK? And something happened to us humans and songbirds and parrots to get us even further advanced than the others. So maybe one day, we will be able to manipulate the mice brain to take its circuit and make it more stronger like humans and get it, or even a chimpanzee, and get it to say apple. And I will go ahead and stop there and leave a summary and take questions. Thank you.